Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I've been doing quite a lot of speeches now, and uh, I never know if I'm repeating myself. I never know if it's a good thing to repeat yourself. But maybe just to start off a little bit uh, with the, the title of this Biennale. It's called The Beauty of Distance, Songs of Survival in a Precarious Age. Why the beauty of distance? Why beauty? It's not a word people use very often in relationship to contemporary art. It's a word, the kind of thing is a little bit old fashioned, a bit 19th century. Concept we don't need now, nowadays. But it's not just beauty in itself, although that itself, if you are lucky enough to find it, is a pretty great thing. But it's the beauty of distance. And when I use that term, what I'm really doing is talking about several things. I'm talking about the way that uh, all of our ideas, and I'm saying all of our, I mean most of the people living on this planet, um, with very few exceptions, our ideas of distance have changed over the past 20 or 30 years. Part of this is about mass travel. People are traveling on a scale and unimaginable before. But they're also communicating with each other uh, in real time. Skype. You don't have to pay anything. And you can talk to anywhere in the world, wherever, whenever you want. That's a pretty amazing thing. And of course, then there's the media. Now, I'm not saying that the media are any better than they used to be or that they're any more truth truthful than they used to be. But certainly, if anything good or anything bad happens in the world, unlike in my father's day, you know about it fairly quickly. And if you have a television set or a radio, you can hear about it or you can see it in front of you, in your own living room. In many cases, it's usually a bad thing happens almost before the bodies are cold. So we're no longer living in a world in which six million or seven million or even the case of Cambodia, two million people suddenly go missing and we say we don't know. We do know. And that gives us all a responsibility. And I think it does give artists a responsibility as well. Because one of the things that art does, it reflects the world, but it also reflects on the world. And uh, one of the great gifts of the European Enlightenment was that, that art in, is in some way a moral activity. By that, I don't mean it's moralizing or moralistic. It's not telling you what you should do or what you should think or what you should feel. You don't want that. There's plenty of that around elsewhere. But it is made, and this is where the idea of beauty comes in, to actually reflect on the world in a constructive way, to reflect on the world in a way that actually is good. And good's a, it's a funny word, huh? I'm interested in good art. It's the only reason I would put any, uh, anything in, a, in an exhibition like this. And good, goodness in art, also inevitably, because art is related to life, maybe directly or, or very, very indirectly. It's certainly not made by people from outer space. The only reason that, uh, that something is good is that it, it leaches out into other ways, into life itself. And if art doesn't reflect life and its values, then it's not very good. So that's a little bit about the background to the thinking to this exhibition, distance critical distance. Certainly when you're looking at an artwork, you have to get away from it to see it properly sometimes. Sounds a little paradoxical. <laughs> see the whole thing. Then you need to go up a little bit closer, see the detail, see the texture of the work. If it's three-dimensional, you need to be able to walk around it. But that's true about, about life as well. You need to know um, something about your own perspective. You need perspective on the rest of the world, but you need to have a perspective on your own perspective to know where you're coming from, particularly if you want to work between cultures, if you want to find out about people who haven't had the same experiences, haven't had the same cultural traditions as yours, but they still have experiences, 
and they still have cultural traditions. And who's to say that they're better or worse than your own? And that at least you should give them time and reflect on them. The other thing about distance, and I've alluded to it very briefly, is that about the distance between what artists feel, experience, and know, and what comes out the other end, between the input and the output. And within that space, whoever you are as an artist, wherever you come from, is the realm of aesthetics. And within that is negotiated, is understood eventually, whether what you've made, and this is the biggest challenge and struggle of all for any artist, with what you've made is any good. So, this Biennale also has the title Songs of Survival in a Precarious Age. Now we're talking about connectivity, about how things, uh, people know much more uh, that's, that's going on in the world. And um, one thing that's really different about now, to say my, my father's time, certainly, is that uh, we have a capacity for self-destruction which is unimaginable in 1940. In 1945, we had an inkling of what it could be. Just earlier this year, we've had a small, insignificant place like Iceland. A volcano goes off, and the whole of world transport is disrupted. Just think if someone sets off a dirty bomb somewhere, either through maliciousness or just stupidity. Either can happen very, very easily. So these kind of um, links, these way that, that the dots are joined up, have really changed. Our capacity for destruction is very great. We're also in an environmental uh, situation which seems to be new. And we're not quite sure whether it's mainly a long-term cycle of cooling and warming of this planet or whether we, as a species, have the main responsibility for it. I'm sure we're, it's both. But, uh, but we really have to do something about uh, how we're going to continue to live on this planet. Because if one bit goes down in the global warming or gets flooded by the waters going up, We'll know about it, and we have to find some space. There's seven venues for this Biennale, scattered around uh, the center of Sydney. I like that very much, because there's all different kinds of space. There's this sort of beautiful, sort of Victorian modern space that we're standing in now. There's Cockatoo Island, which was a, which was a prison, the shipbuilding works. There's the Pier 23, which was a uh, uh, early 20th century warehouse, there's the Botanic Gardens, there's the Sydney Opera House, one of the great architectural icons, not only of Australia, but actually of the whole world. So you could say we're working, using as a platform, this iconic modern city, which would be recognized almost anywhere. But not so long ago, just 250 years ago, it was some West didn't know it. They were just beginning to discover it. And it's the site, really, of the first encounters with the people who lived here, with the indigenous people. And that, for me, is, uh, is pretty fascinating. 250 years, how many generations is that? It's not so many. Six? Could be six long generations. Seven? And that's also chiming, timing in with the European Enlightenment. The idea that progress, the world could be known and possessed, that knowledge could be just added to and added to until we knew almost everything. I think nowadays we're rather, rather more circumspect about that idea. The idea that one person, one culture, one encyclopedia, one group of people could know everything, it seems infantile. There's so many different kinds of knowledge. There's so many different ways of knowing the world. I've tried to reflect that now in this exhibition. To look back over 250 years in the contemporary art show, which is all the work is made more or less now, 
and to look at how artists have reflected on these issues themselves. Maybe here, and uh, I've called this little section uh, a focus on Asia, is a good part to start, a good place to start. Aida Makoto's painting over there, which is behind you, it's uh, the Japanese calligraphy, and it's called Calligraphy School. And that's absolutely what it says. Now, if you're Japanese, you could think that's a kind of a front. Oh, why are you saying that? You know, except that it's rather beautiful. It's not just any calligraphy, it's rather good calligraphy. Not made in uh, ink, but actually cut out of vinyl. So it was originally done in ink and then scanned and cut out of vinyl. If you don't know, what do you make of it? It's a different culture, a different way of looking at the world, a different way of making pictograms, a different tradition. And that artists in East Asia are working with tradition consistently in their work, criticizing, critiquing it, which is something that Aida Makoto does all the time. And if you go to the top floor, the fourth floor of the Museum of Contemporary Art, you'll see two very different very strong works by him. This is also strong, I believe, but very different indeed. And in that, he's critiquing very strongly contemporary Japanese society. Over there in the corner, Liu Zhuanhua. He's in his 40s. He's from uh, Shanghai, or at least he lives in Shanghai now. He's born in the area of South China where Jianwe comes from. So this is... Uh, Southern Sung period, some of the best black teaware was made there. And uh, he then, uh, when he studied, he studied in the Zhanxian uh, porcelain works. And uh, for over a thousand years, this has also been one of the main centers of porcelain production within China, particularly uh, gaining uh, uh, fame the late Song period, then on to the Ming period, and even to the present day, they're producing any amount of, 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 of colored porcelain, although sadly of a, of, a, of a lower quality than before. There's a light celadon glaze on those, but as you look inside those pots, they're beautiful classical forms, you find a red, a red glaze. You're not sure what it is, even whether it's a glaze or not. It looks like liquid, it looks like blood. It looks like congealed blood. And there's something a little bit the same that Li Juanhua is getting at, to maybe Aida Makoto's getting at in his approach to tradition. That history, our recent past, and maybe our future are soaked in blood and dressed up in culture. Is it an either or, culture or brutality? Or is it the same thing? It's an open question, and an important question. Similar kinds of question marks are raised behind me in this work by uh, Rakib Shaw, who's an artist of Kashmiri origins now living in London. Uh, I'm sure you know about Kashmiri art, Kashmiri lacquerware. Uh, Kashmiri shawls. Um, and in this, he's taken lacquerware and combined it with, with enamelware. And indeed, there is some metalwork that made in that area. So this is like a cloisonné painting technique in which not only he, but more, more, <laughs> more likely a whole studio full of people, of assistants, are working with magnifying glasses and ostrich feathers to create the kind of effect that you see behind me. It's decorative, certainly. Lotus blossoms, well, lotus blossoms are peppered throughout the whole of um, uh, Asian art uh, and throughout its history. But strange, violent acts seems to be taking place. Whenever I look at this, this is made particularly for this Biennale. Whenever I look at it, because it was new to me when it arrived here, I knew other things, I, s I see something new every time. But this, uh, this shark, this kind of Jaws figure with a diamante 
string from one of its teeth. One of its teeth is being pulled out by what looks like a, a kind of squid or a hermit crab with the head and antlers of a deer holding some kind of diadem. I mean, what world does this guy live in? It's a good question. Um, he lives now and works in London, very often filling his studio full of chrysanthemums. He's an agoraphobic. He doesn't like to go outside hardly at all. Um, and you get a feeling that he's creating, he's creating this very intense, this very hyper world of his own in which all the feelings that we have, the emotions, the conflicts that we all have from childhood in, into our adulthood are sort of playing themselves out on this, on this flat field. I worked for five years in Tokyo. I was lucky to do that, and I've been interested in, in Asian art and, in particular, uh, Japanese art for many years, and in 1985, made one of the first exhibitions in the West on uh, post-war avant-garde art in Japan. But my experience living there actually gave me access to a whole generation of young artists, including Makoto, but particularly uh, Hisashi Temnuya there, uh, who's made this triptych. It's called Neo Thousand Armed Cannon. Started making it in 2004. Um, Sorry, he started making it in 2002, and it was uh, his reaction to the events in New York, which are described as 9-11. And uh, again, it sort of reflects on how the world is joined up. A number of uh, artists, uh, Sai Guo Chung on Cockatoo Island, if we go there into the main machine hall in the old turbine hall, you'll see these nine cars exploding and rotating in space. They're his thought about terrorism. He lives in New York now, although he's Chinese. They were his thought about 9-11. And actually, the idea between his, the, the, the main idea between, the main idea behind his work was that there's no cause without effect. And that horror, that beauty itself can sometimes be horrific. And horror itself can sometimes be beautiful. And that maybe you should not try and have a war on terror, because terror is something you feel within yourself, and you end up warring with yourself. But you should look further. Again, what I was talking about, critical distance. You should look further to the context of terror and try and think why it happens, why people are pushed to commit such vile acts. So this work, the Neo Thousand Armed Canon. Canon is the Japanese god and goddess, goes both ways, of mercy and compassion. And the thousand arms are to clutch the world, to him, her, in compassion, to actually save the world. But as you see in those thousand arms, they're not open, inviting, they're full of rifles, knives, pistols, Kalashnikovs, every kind of weapon you can imagine. So an image of peace, an image of reconciliation, of compassion, is turned into this monster. And these guardians, either side, familiar figures in any Japanese, Buddhist, Shinto, Taoist temple, uh, they themselves are, are not protecting the faith, which is their function traditionally. They're terrifying and aggressive because they're protecting the Buddhist faith. Now here they have Kalashnikovs, and they'll pick you off if they have a chance. The style of this is, uh, is very much a late Tang, um, early Kamakura style of painting. It, he learned, he's taught himself, he's self-taught, he didn't go to art school. He's taught himself all the different historical styles of painting. It's made on wooden board. So you can see it's a little bit artificially aged as well. Um, and for all that, that, all those issues, all those elements were very important to him in making it. If we go this way, 
And just look down there, there's another Japanese artist, just a couple of years older in his mid-40s than Temnuya, who I was talking about, called Akira Yamaguchi. And he mainly does images of cities or images of landscape. And he follows many of the mannerisms of traditional so-called classical style Kano painting. So these were the Kyoto-based artists who painted for the Japanese imperial court from the 16th century onwards. And so they created a world in which there were tea houses and emperors and noblemen and courtiers, and they're all smothered by these occasional golden clouds. So there was a world of heaven and a world of the earth, and the two seemed to be melding together. What you see in Yamaguchi's works from modern cities, the Tokyo Tower, you can see in two of them. It's a, a Tokyo version of the Eiffel Tower, actually a little bit taller than the original. And the city of Tokyo, you can see it changing almost before your eyes as you look through it, smothered in swathes of toxic fog. So the golden clouds of the Tano Kano school in, in Yamaguchi's work are still very delicate. They're still beautifully made. They're still full of detail. But they're about now. They're about Edo now, which became Tokyo. They're about Japan now. They're about the world now. Now, if you just cast your eye on further, just to the next section of the wall. It's two large photographs by a Beijing-based artist called Wang Ching Song. Wang Ching Song's about the same age as uh, all these guys here, and some women, not just guys. I'll come to the women in a moment. And he's made two works. One is from 2004, it's called Competition, and the other one is from last year, and it's called Debacle. And I included these because they're, they're a, a kind of portrait, not only of the Chinese, but of the world economy over a five-year period. Competition, it's, a, it's a, a kind of tableau vivant. He made this huge stage set, people standing, balancing on the top of ladders, and they're pasting up posters with different logos on them. Citibank, Nike, Puma, McDonald's, all those logos, slap, 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 slap. Burgeoning capitalism in China. Strong, racing economy of an Asian tiger. What do you see in 2009? The work on the left? It's called Debacle. It's flat. The posters are still there on the wall, but no one's put up any new ones. It's rained. All the type has got smeared away. It's run away into the gutters. And what you're ended up with is something like an abstract painting. The last work to which I'd like to refer has been slightly pushed to one side tonight because of a, because of a, uh, a reception, but you can see it there. It's actually made by uh, Jennifer Wen Ma, uh, a Chinese-American artist in her 30s. And uh, she's made a series of planting tubs using native Australian plants. And she's painted them all with black India ink. Uh, and the idea behind this is uh, it's a comment on, on uh, environmental despolation, of course, and toxicity in the atmosphere. But what she's really interested in, as this Biennale continues, and continue it will until the 1st of August, is actually the green shoots of life, the flowers. These are the things that will actually grow during this time. And so you have the black leaves, the black stalks, the black bark, and underneath life, growth, something new. It's a beautiful work shown for the first time here. You'll see many other, if you haven't already. I hope you get around to the other six venues. Uh, it won't cost you any money. 
It's one of the only biennales, the only large exhibitions on this scale anywhere in the world, I know, which has the generosity of spirit to offer itself free of charge to the public. And I really hope that you and your friends and your families will take good advantage of it. Thank you.